what he can accomplish. Pretty impressive man. Was really burdened and stressed in his life and just overcome with worry and the things that come with that, stress and just uh, on the verge of uh, collapse. And he said to his friend, I, I uh, found a man that I can talk to and takes away all my stress and all my worry. It's great. And I do this every week. His friend said, that's wonderful. How much does it cost? He said, $1,000 a week. His friend said, how you pay for that? He said, that's his worry. <laughs> the man that he was talking to, that's his worry. Well, we're talking about uh, being stressed today. Last week in our series of sermons under the title, Tell It to Jesus, we talked about being afraid. Remember that? Being afraid. And even in this text, Jesus warns us and instructs us about fear and uh, not living in fear when he said uh, uh, not to be afraid over and over in the Bible. But let's, uh, let's talk about stress. Father in heaven, as we focus in on this wonderful passage that Ray read to us. We're so thankful that it is in your word, the Bible, and uh, that we can be reassured that we have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Father who knows what our needs are. And you said in the book of Psalms, chapter 37, the righteous not be found begging bread. We trust you and your word. And I remember, Father, that elderly professor that I had in college who said, David, I don't have very many bad days. And I know, Father, that life wasn't perfect for him. He just entrusted everything in his life to you. May, Father, what was in that man and what is in your word be in us. That we can live not with the head knowledge, but the heart knowledge. When Paul said, if God be for me, who can be against me? To this end, we pray for your help and your blessing, your comfort, your strength. Your instruction in Jesus name. Amen. We live in stressful times, perhaps more so in the last year and a half, things that have gone on in our world and affected uh, uh, even our own lives personally, and people in your family and your friends, brings about stress. I think I know, live long enough to know one or two things about stress. I know what it's like to have a ultrasound nurse looking at a monitor and, and saying this, here's baby number one, here's baby number two, and here's baby number three. I have an idea the rest of you have never experienced that. That's uh, when stress goes off the chart. <laughs> I know the experience of having three children in the ICU unit of the hospital for weeks on end with IVs in the side of their head because their veins are too small and their arms to use and being susceptible to all the fragile things of Life that can compromise an infant who's born 10 weeks early and perhaps take their life as you see them on a respirator and then come off and go back on. I know about that. 
I know about insurance bill over $300,000 with two insurance companies battling each other about who's going to pay and wondering if it was going to be left uh, to neither of them. I know about that. I know what it's like to be fired by men who I was told to apologize to who were seeking to get me fired. (laughs) I know what that's like. Yeah, I know what it's like to be in college and not have a whole lot, have a go to school all week and have a weekend ministry where you got to teach Sunday school and preach and, and teach on Sunday night and then go back, go back to college and go to school all week and be ready because Sunday comes around every seven days. Yeah, I know what that's like. I know what it's like to preach a funeral for the very first time. You talk about stress. Or to officiate at a wedding for the very first time. That's maybe even more stressful because there's no bride's mothers at a funeral. (laughs) Uh, I know the stress of coming from a broken home and having one of those myself. I know about that. But you could come up here and tell your story, couldn't you? Some of you could tell about losing a child or perhaps more than one child and the great pain that has come into your life because of that. Some of you could tell about sexual abuse and the lasting hurt that can follow a person all their life because of sexual abuse. Perhaps some could tell about abortion and the overwhelming trauma that comes uh, from that decision. Some could perhaps tell about addiction and the trouble that is there to overcome being addicted to alcohol or drugs or pornography or some other destructive thing in your life. Some of you perhaps could tell about crime and a crime that was committed in your family and the great destruction that it brought and the hurt because a crime was committed by someone in your family. Some of you could tell about cancer and what cancer did to your mom or your dad or your grandparents or your children and the hurt that cancer brought into your family and is, is now bringing into your family even, even today. Others could tell about the disappointment that comes from trying to lead others to Christ and they just don't want to listen. Some of you could come up here and tell about court rulings where you feel like the the court of men where they're supposed to be, uh, as we pledge this morning, justice for all. And you feel like justice has not been meted out. In your personal situation, you could tell about that. Some of you may have more bills than you have money. You have trouble with the meeting ends meet. And you're wondering what's going to happen. And again, as we said, for the past year and a half, there's been uh, more stress added to our world. Preacher friend of mine lives in northern Indiana, a small rural community. Wife just died of, of COVID, a healthy woman, 72 years of age. Imagine that, uh, from rural farming community, a virus that came out of China affecting people in remote places all around the world. Webster defines stress as, and I quote, a state of mental tension and worry caused by problems in your life, your work, etc. I like that. A state of mental tension. Mental tension. Maybe it's sort of like our mind is like a golf ball going off in a tile bathroom. Ping, 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 ping. Yeah, I like that analogy. Stress. Yeah, you you are well acquainted with it. Let's talk about what Jesus said about this subject from Luke chapter 12. And first of all, let's talk about the cause. 
the cause of stress. And there are many, there, there are some that I won't mention in these half a dozen or so that we will mention. We've already mentioned health issues. There are health issues in your family, health issues with your children, your parents. Uh, may not can cause a lot of stress. Many areas, but let's just note several here this morning. The first one is our own sin. Our own sin. Wild oats is the only thing people sow and then hope for a crop failure. David sowed his wild oats with a woman who was another man's wife. Her name was Bathsheba. And Bathsheba found out she was pregnant and, and she sent a message. She, maybe she wrote, wrote a note on a piece of paper and, or whatever, a piece of papyrus. And sent that, and David uh, uh, unfolded the note, and that's when life got real stressful. Yeah, yeah. Moses saw two Israelites fighting. Well, he said, why, why are you fighting with your brother? You guys are brothers. And the man said to him, are you going to kill me like you did that Egyptian? And that would just happen the day before. Moses didn't think anybody saw that. You talk about stress. Now the, the word is out. They're going to put Moses' picture in every post office in Egypt. And he fled. Talk about stress. That murder that I committed was uh, not as secret as I thought it was. Psalms 32 verses 3, Psalms 32 verses 3 through 5 says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all, all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Why? God is seeking our repentance. My vitality was drained away with the fever of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Psalm 32, three through five. Notice that when this individual has unconfessed sin in his life, what does he have? Lack of strength, uh, uh, life sapped out of him. There's a lot of people that could get well in this life if they just repent and turn to God. They'd get a, they'd get a, a lot more well than they currently are because behavior that is offending God and hindering them, damaging their life is bringing stress into their life. But what about the sins of others causes stress? The sins of others also causes stress. I've already mentioned Moses. Now let's mention Moses 40 years later, after he led the Israelites out of uh, Egypt and, and they were camped there at Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai, they began to groan and gripe and bellyache. And they said, we want meat. And we want to go back to Egypt where there was onions and, and leeks and garlic and watermelon and, and, and all that stuff. We're sick and tired of this angel food from heaven called manna. <laughs> And Moses cried out to God. He said, I, I cannot carry all these people. I can't carry them. So the sins and lack of faith of the Israelite people produced great stress in Moses' life. Potiphar's wife, a pot of fire, cost Joseph two years of his life at least in prison. Because he rejected her, her sexual advances. She cried rape and Joseph went to prison for it. Although he had a smile on his face, it seems he said to the butler and the baker, why are you guys so sad today? <laughs> Joseph hadn't done anything wrong, yet he asked them, guys, what's wrong with you? You know, the sins of others. John the Baptist lost his head because of a strip tease party. And Herod made a rash vow and she said, Herodias said, I'll take the head of John the Baptist. And he went along with it. John lost his head. Young man in his 30s 
The sins of others cost him his life. Sometimes the sins of others harm us at work, at home, and in our daily lives. Sometimes people, sometimes preachers make fun of counseling. And, and uh, sometimes people don't need counseling because of what they've done wrong. You know why they need counseling? For what's been done to them. For what's been done to them. Doesn't have anything to do with what they've done. It's what's been done to them. Our sin and the sins of others cause great stress. But then there's service to God. Service to God causes stress. Elijah had a great victory on Mount Carmel. Remember that? The, the bullock offering, and the, he had the duel with the prophets of Baal and said, uh, whoever, whoever can, can bur- burn this, this offering up wins the, wins the contest. And they cried out to their God, oh, Baal, oh, Baal, <laughs> from noon, from morning to noon. And Elijah made fun of him. He said, maybe, you're, maybe your prophet's asleep. Maybe he's on a journey. Maybe your God's asleep, rather. Maybe he's on a journey. And they flagellated themselves, mixed their blood with the altar, and nothing happened. Then Elijah prayed, and God burned up that offering, licked up the stones around it, even though it was saturated with water. But then Jezebel put a, put a bounty on, on Elijah's life, and she said, I'm going to kill you by tomorrow. And Elijah got depressed, stressed and depressed, sat down and begged God to take his life. Sometimes service to God and, and battling the devil can cause Stress. Paul said five times I was beaten by the Jews, 40 minus one, that's 39 times five is 195 times. And he said in that great second Corinthians text, apart from all that, there's the daily pressure of me of the churches, the stress of the ministry and service to God, battling the devil and can be, can be heavy, the work of the Lord sometimes can cause stress. Then there's satanic attack, satanic attack. What about that? Well, I'm not sure how much rope God allows the devil to have, but I know this Job chapter two, verse seven says, then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. How much worse can it get? What, Job, what, what had Job done wrong? Nothing. Nothing. Satanic attack on his life. And I don't know how much rope the devil has to attack us. He can't kill us, obviously, or he would. Uh, God has a tether on him. But no doubt his attack, and perhaps through other people, through the government, <laughs> is the way it happens in our day and time. Fifthly, now, let's... After that bit of deviation from the text, let's go back to the text and misplaced understanding of life. For a couple moments here, let's, let's, let's hone in on what Jesus said in that text that Ray read when he said, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or about your body, what you'll wear. What's that? Food and fashion. The things that people are obsessed with, aren't they? Food and fashion. Jesus said, don't worry about food and don't worry about fashion. Why? He said, life is more than food and the body more than clothes. The people that lived in Jesus' day, they lived, as we would say, hand to mouth. They lived to survive. There were no refrigerators, no pantries like we have, no malls, no grocery stores. The people literally lived by what's known as what? Daily bread. And Jesus says to these people that ate day to day, your life is more than that. You're you're not like an animal that just lives to eat and sleep, go to the bathroom. You're more than that. You see, we're not just material, we're spiritual. We're not just here to exist. God has a purpose for us. And and, and I love that statement. I've been thinking about it so much. Jesus said, 
Life is more than food and, and, and the body more than clothes. Think about that. Life is more than that. You say, well, if, if I don't take care of me, who's going to? Well, here's the answer to that. You do your part and God will take care of the rest. Jesus said, life is more than food in the body clothing. That's, that's just the bare bones necessity. Life is more than that. And, and he's saying, I know that. Don't worry about your life. It's more than that. Well, God recognizes that we're more valuable than birds and flowers, the illustration Jesus gave. Last point here under this long first point is misunderstood provision. <laughs> we already have an example in our text that God will provide. Jesus said, look at the ravens, the crows, the birds. They don't what? You ever see a bird driving a tractor? <laughs> no, they don't plant and they don't Harvest. They don't have a barn to store things. Birds have no way of providing for their, for their own in any kind of way of, of planting and harvesting and storing. They're totally dependent on outside source to provide their very daily needs of the sustenance of life. They have no capability of creating their own food supply. Birds... I guess maybe the birds give God glory in their own way, right? But we far more give God glory through our praise. And Jesus says, here, here, here's an example for you. The birds are incapable, and yet what happens? The birds don't what? Don't die of starvation. Birds don't die of starvation. Even when, even when our bird feeder's empty. Somehow they, God feeds them. Here's an example for you, Jesus is saying. The last verse in Job 38. Who prepares for the raven its nourishment when it's young, cry to God and wander about without food? I love that. God asked Job all these questions and, and uh, he's not really looking for an answer. A rhetorical question. Look at that. Look at that verse. What's the answer? Who prepares for the raven as nourishment? When his young cry to God and wander about without food. What's the answer to that? God does. Yeah. Yeah. Now we know why God made, made birds that eat dead flesh like buzzards. They clean things up. So there are many, many causes of stress and maybe it's our misplaced understanding of, of, of life, that, that life is more than just food and clothing. And life is more than just seeking provision. God knows we need those things. But now let's look at a dark cloud here, the consequences of stress. Let's talk about some consequences Jesus said, being stressed and worried and anxious won't lengthen our life by even one what? By even one hour. <laughs> Some of us, if, it, if, if stress and worry could lengthen our life, we'd never die. But Jesus said, you can't even lengthen your life by one hour, but we might decrease it. Yes, we might decrease it. Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxiety in the heart of man weighs it down. Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in the heart of a man weighs it down. Do we have that? Nope. Okay. Missed that. That's all right. Proverbs 17, 22. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Something about laughing that makes you feel better, doesn't it? A joyful heart, but a broken spirit just dries up the bones. Yeah. 
Jesus was in the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, uh, his best friends, perhaps. And Mary was seated at Jesus' feet, listening intently to him. And Martha was worried about lunch. Remember that? She was scurrying around, wor worrying about being the, ho the hostess there. And um, she got on Jesus and said, tell my sister to help me. We're not going to be able to eat lunch. Luke 10, 41, the Lord answered her and said, said to her rather, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things. You worried and bothered about so many things. Mary has chosen the good part that will not be taken away from her. The word worry in the English comes from a German word, Worgen, or maybe it's pronounced Vergen. I'm not German. I don't know. Maybe I am. <laughs> but it means to choke or strangle. W-E-R-G-E-N. That's the, the root of the word worry. Worgen means to choke or strangle. Choke or strangle. Worry is mental Strangulation, that's what it is. It's that golf ball in a tile bathroom going off in your mind, wear, wearing you out, wearing me out. Through fear, anxiety, worry, stress, it can lead to significant health problems. Like what? Heart disease, high blood pressure, ulcers. <laughs> and it's the mother of depression. Perhaps it's not so much what we're eating, although we need to be somewhat concerned about what, what we're eating, but it's what's eating us. That's the bigger issue, what's eating us. Yeah. Dr. E. Stanley Jones in his book, Transformed by Thorns, said, and I quote, we are inwardly constructed in nerve and tissue, brain cell and soul for faith and not for fear. God made us that way. To live by worry is to live against our created nature. Did you hear that? To live by worry is against our created nature. Close quote. Someone said worry is like a rocking chair. It'll give you something to do, but you won't get anywhere. William James said, God may forgive our sins, but the nervous system never does. The nervous system never does. Summers, and I don't know how you say his last name, Rocky, Rachi, R-A-C-H-E. I don't know exactly how you pronounce it. But I like this statement. Worry, stress is a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. If encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other, all other thoughts are drained. It's a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. And if it's encouraged, it cuts a channel which all other thoughts are drained. Yeah, it takes a lot, a lot of energy, doesn't it, to do nothing. Well, the world has some remedies for stress and fretting and, and worrying. What are they? You can take a course on stress management. <laughs> you, you can do that. You can receive cognitive therapy. What do many people do? Medicate their stress with addiction to alcohol, drugs, pornography, other, other addictions, shopping maybe, shopping sprees, uh, going various types of binge behavior, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders where people wash their hands incessantly or pull their hair out, literally pull their hair out. Uh, perhaps the ultimate result is a total collapse and a breakdown caused by stress. But that's enough of a dark cloud. The uh, causes of it, uh, consequences. Let's talk about the cure now. For a few moments, let's talk about the cure. Jesus doesn't offer stress management. He offers 
stress-free living, if you will, as a part of the gospel message. He, he teaches us how to unhook it, how to lay it down, how to lay that burden down. And remember, he said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon yourselves and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Yeah. Jesus tells us how to eliminate it, how to handle it, give it to him. At least 12 times Jesus said, do not be anxious or do not worry. At least 12 times. But let's go back to the text that Ray read earlier, and I want to read part of it again. Last part of it, Luke 12. Let's take a look at this. But if God so cl clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? And do not seek what you will eat or what you will drink and do not keep worrying. Notice that. These things, the nations of the world, the Gentiles, they eagerly seek those things. Food and fashion, food and fashion, food and fashion. But your father knows that you need these things. Seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid. There is that statement, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Now notice what that text says. God makes grass look beautiful. In Matthew's text, it says, not even Solomon in all his glory, the richest man in the world, could clothe himself in splendor as beautiful as the, the roses are. Is there anything more beautiful than a, a rose in full bloom? You know, God closed that, closed that rose, then it's thrown in the fire. They used dried flowers and dried grass in Jesus' day to build fires. Notice the bold statement. How much more will he, will he clothe you? Flowers are beautiful, but they don't mean anything to God compared to what you mean to him. But your next, look at the next bold statement. Your father knows. Your father knows. Seek his kingdom. Your father has chosen gladly to give you that. And these other things will what? Have a way of taking care of themselves. Let's make three points of application here in the end of this message. The first one is, don't act like an orphan. Said the robin to the sparrow, I'd really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and hurry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, surely it must be they have no heavenly father that cares for them such as you and me. <laughs> yeah, bird, bird theology, birdology, ornithology. <laughs> Jesus said, your father knows what? Knows that you need these things. Let me tell you something. Sometimes if you, if you get a conviction in your mind that you need to do something to help somebody, fall through with that. Pursue that. Oftentimes, God answers people's prayers, not through man in the sky, but through other people. Does that make sense to you? Think about that. If somebody's on your mind, maybe they're on your mind for a reason. And uh, God's using you to bless them. Mary Crowley in her book, Be Somebody, said, Every evening I turn my worries over to God. He's going to be up all night anyway. Close quote. He works a night shift. Well, if God's not your father, then who is your father? Satan. He's not going to give us anything, but only seek to take away from us. As Jesus said in John 10, 10, to steal, kill, and destroy. Yeah. Harold Fowler's passed away now. Some of you knew Harold, his wife, Enid. They were missionaries to Italy. And uh, he, Harold wrote four books on the 28 chapters of the book of Matthew. I've got all four of them. You know, four books or commentaries about that wide. And, and he told me personally, 
when I got to Matthew chapter six, which is the text that, that, Claire, uh, that uh, Ray read to us from Luke 12, it's the same text in Matthew six about uh, uh, there, about the birds and the, and the lilies of the field. And he said, when I got to Matthew six, I had to ask myself, I really believe this because we were having some struggles on the mission field. But the Fowlers served in Italy for over 50 years in the shadow of the Vatican, trying to tell people that there's a church that Jesus built and that one's not it. Over 50 years, guess what? God met their needs, didn't he? Yep. Don't live like an orphan. Secondly, seek his, seek his kingdom. Seek his kingdom. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom, right? We'll come to that. We'll come to that in a moment. So you want food and drink and clothing? You want to be free from stress, worry, and fear? Then you don't focus on food, clothing, bank accounts. You focus on the kingdom of being useful to God. Not keeping up with the Joneses, not food and fashion. Make the focus of your life worship, service, telling others about Christ, ministry. Make that the focus of your life. As a child of God, you're valuable to him. He knows that more than the birds are. And that's why he said in Matthew 6, 33, same passage, same story. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness all these things will be added to you. Let me ask you a question. All what things? Food, clothing, shelter, the needs of life. He said, don't worry, don't go fretting about food and shelter and clothing. You seek my kingdom. You serve me. The rest of it will take care of itself. These things will be added to you, but you've got to seek the kingdom. See, see, that's a paradox, isn't it? I'm not going to sit around and worry about that. I'm going to do what I can. God told me to work and, and take care of him. You know, man won't work. Bible says don't feed him. In our day and time, we'll get you a check. <laughs> How much you need? Bible says a man won't work, don't feed him. We have to do our part. But we've got we to be useful to God and seek his kingdom. Those other things will take care of themselves because we're more valuable to God than birds and flowers. Lastly, walk by faith. Walk by faith. Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He didn't say they had no faith, but what did he say they had? You men of little faith, little faith, itty bitty faith, you men of little faith. We're tempted to say just suppose, and those just supposes are deadly. What if Noah would have said, just suppose it doesn't rain? <laughs> what if David would have said, just suppose the stone doesn't hit Goliath in the head? What if Peter said, just suppose if I get out of this boat, I might drown? Yeah, they didn't say just suppose. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Isn't that interesting? Be anxious for nothing. What, what, what words could you replace that word with? Stress, fretting, right? But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Notice that template there. What's the threefold template? We're told, don't be anxious, but do what instead? Pray. And the result of that is God's peace. God's peace takes over. That's a command, isn't it? Just like thou shalt not steal. In all, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm just about finished. But in all honesty, you know what worry is? It's a lack of faith. That's what it is. It's a lack of faith. 
When I was a kid, we sang this song. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. There is a place of comfort sweet near to the heart of God, a place where we, our Savior, meet near to the heart of God. There is a place of full release near to the heart of God, a place where all is joy and peace near to the heart of God. You might know by now what the title of that song is. And then the chorus says this, Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before thee. Where? Near to the heart of God. Are you stressed? Tell it to Jesus. Jesus.